Actually, he did not. <laughs> but I heard him say. <laughs> So again, I was just curious. Uh, First, do you know what's in those books? Oh <laughs> yeah. You know where your priorities are. Jake goes to Michigan, and you're in Trinidad. <laughs> <laughs> just so you guys know, there was frost on the sprinklers at my house this morning. <laughs> Thank you, Dan. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'd like to reconvene uh, June 10th and 11th at the Colorado Parks and Wildlife Commission meeting. Um, we will move forward with our agenda. Uh, but before we do that, I'd like to uh, again express our apologies about yesterday's um, meeting and our ability to stream it to the public. I uh, understand it was very difficult to hear us yesterday, and then sometimes uh, even uh, the video wasn't so good. Uh, we're doing our best to try to correct that today, and I'd also like to point out that what we do is um, look for a uh, our best recorded copy uh, that we did here today and post that on our website after the meeting concludes. Um, that may not have video associated with it, but again, we'll do our best to get you a, an audio copy that you can hear and really hear uh, everything that happened at the meeting yesterday. So again, our apologies. Um, you know, you kind of battle these elements sometimes when we're doing our best to travel to different parts of the state and provide an opportunity for citizens to come for this solution, which, you know, thankfully we can now do as we slowly move out of the, uh, the COVID restrictions and, and get to different areas of the state. So again, thank you for your patience and understanding with regards to that. Again, welcome to our meeting. We'll begin today's meeting with Laura to execute a uh, roll call for us today. Adams. Present. Lecca. Present. Garcia. All here. Askett. Here. Hauser. Here. May. Present. Phillips. Here. Schaefer. Present. Hudson. Present. Hardy. Present. Chairman Kidd. Present. Thank you. Um, with that, let, uh, let's move to uh, item 17, which is our consent agenda. Um, we did not have any uh, modifications or requests to, or for removals from the consent agenda yesterday. So I would move directly to asking for a motion to adopt the consent agenda. So moved. moved by Commissioner Garcia, second by Commissioner Haskett. Um, I think this is my voice vote. So, all in favor of the motion to approve the consent agenda say aye. Aye. All opposed, same sign. Hearing none, it passes unanimously. Um, with that, let's move forward to item agenda number 18. I believe Brett Ackerman, the Southeast Regional Manager, uh, is going to lead us on a discussion with regards to siting of solar. Uh, and wildlife impacts in the state of Colorado. Good morning, Brett. Welcome. Good morning, thank you, Mr. Chair. Brett Ackerman, Southeast Regional Manager for Colorado Parks and Wildlife. And I uh, appreciate the opportunity to sit down and talk a little bit today about our uh, solar best management practices. I'm going to tag team this presentation with uh, Dr. Karen Voltura, who I should have uh, remotely. And so I'll eventually pass the presentation over her to her for the meat of uh, what we're going to talk about today. But because you haven't met her, because you got a chance to meet some of our uh, exceptional staff yesterday, I also wanted to point out that we have great staff and many expertise throughout the division and our solar expert throughout the state, although we have a lot of people that know a lot, is uh, Dr. Voltura. 
She's a wildlife biologist specializing in behavioral ecology and wildlife responses to development. Since 2016, she's been here with us in the Southeast region as our lead uh, for land use planning and NEPA and energy and all things land use. <clears throat> Prior to joining CPW, she worked for five years on avian radar applications <clears throat> for renewable energy and environmental research. And she concentrated on bird and bat mortality issues. And before that, worked on many projects for the United States Air Force uh, on the prevention of bird strikes uh, with aircraft. Uh, Dr. Voltura received her PhD in zoology from the University of Oklahoma. We're fortunate to have her on our staff here today. Um, we did want to talk a little bit about uh, best management practices for solar energy development. And uh, this, uh, Thank you, appreciate that. So the reason that we're here talking about solar energy is that I think everyone here is likely aware that solar energy has uh, begun to proliferate quite a bit in many places. And it's a discussion that's uh, being had by many of our peers throughout the country. And uh, in many ways, solar energy is a good thing. Uh, solar energy helps us reduce our carbon footprint. It helps reduce emissions, something we certainly are globally concerned about. Uh, it does have some impacts, and so I wanted to talk a little bit about those today and how we address those and how we intend to address those in Colorado. Just to give you an idea of uh, what we're looking at here in Colorado, uh, this pie chart you can see, we've had uh, a lot of applications for solar uh, projects that come through, and they usually come through the county and then through the 1041 process. We in no way regulate solar, so solar to us is much like any other land use where the county might come to us and say, please tell us what you believe the impacts on wildlife will be uh, on this particular project. So in the southeast region, we've had 34 projects proposed in the last four years or so uh, at a total of about 77,000 acres. And you can see the northeast region has had during that same period of time 52 projects of 20,000 acres. Uh, the northwest, about 9,000 acres with 12 projects and the southwest, 4,000 acres. So a significant amount of acreage being proposed for potential solar development throughout the state. And here we're at the uh, kind of at the inception of utility scale solar project uh, planning. As I mentioned, uh, like any other land use, solar has some impacts. Um, some things that we generally take a look at are the impacts to big game winter range and migration corridors. And a lot of these projects take place in what we consider relatively sensitive uh, grouse habitats, so prairie chicken, sage grouse, sharp tailed grouse, those types of things. And many of them also impact uh, raptor nests, bald eagle nests, those types of, uh, of species. Uh, right now, we've got, uh, you can see in the bottom right of this slide, uh, in the southeast region, those projects that have moved past the planning stage into the actual permitted stage. In the southeast region, we've got 10 projects at about 20,000 acres, and the north and south at about 3,000 acres. So that's what our initial landscape looks like here. So what we usually do is, like I mentioned, the county will come to us and say, please send us a letter as to what the effects of this development will be. And so we do that. That's what we've been doing. We write that letter, and we send it out so the county can take a look at it through the permitting process. Um, there's been an increasing demand for us to kind of get that out a little sooner and help people understand the types of things that we're concerned about with regard to solar, the types of things that they might see ultimately when they receive a letter after they submit their application. And so that's the inception of this BMP document. We wanted to get the primary concern that often come up with solar projects into a document that people can look at beforehand in the planning stage. And they can see these are the types of things that we want to try to avoid, minimize, and mitigate. Um, it was developed largely because of the proliferation of solar that we can see to see here in Colorado. And the one point that I wanted to make is that it's not intended to replace the letter or the site-specific analysis. We'll continue to do that. It's solely intended to put information out there earlier so people can see some of the concerns that are likely going to arise throughout the process. And it's also intended to be a living document. We, we base it on the best available science and uh, our best experience as of the current day. And just like anything else, we'll get better at solar. Developers will get better at solar. The counties will get better at planning solar as well. So we intend to 
modify this document a bit from time to time. And uh, our primary targeted users are the developers, as I mentioned, so they can see what our concerns are likely going to be, but also for county planners and other agencies as they consider their larger uh, solar plans uh, in areas where solar energy requests continue to proliferate. And then, of course, our staff. We generally coordinate very well, and our, our comments are pretty consistent throughout the state, and certainly there are always uh, area-specific issues, but we tend to uh, to make sure that our comments are consistent throughout the state on any one issue. This BMP document will also help you guide to staff. So this has been in development for quite some time as uh, solar has prol proliferated. And uh, generally what we've done is we've taken the, the learning that we've had as we've commented on these projects, and we've incorporated it in, into this document. And we've also had a lot of discussions with solar energy developers. But there's some science out there too that we've uh, reviewed and and, uh, and incorporated the best available science and guidance documents that are out there today. Uh, when we went through these, we drafted a document and our energy and land use staff and primarily Dr. Voltura helped draft the initial document, uh, reviewed it, and then we sent it out to our field staff statewide who had some questions and concerns and helped uh, refine that document. Uh, once the field was good with it, we went to the senior staff and, and larger habitat coordinators and ultimately the leadership team to review this document. And uh, we also incorporated comments from the counties uh, into this document. And we wanted to go as far as we could to help uh, make sure that this draft was in good shape. And so we had a peer review by some other states that are also dealing with uh, solar development we went out to. Uh, you can see here Ohio, Oregon, Texas, Kansas, and Georgia that are working draft. And right now, only a handful of state agencies have uh, current solar energy guidelines. And so we're, we're a little bit on the uh, on the forefront <clears throat> of this here. And so that was that's generally our purpose and our process for the solar VMPs. I wanted to, with your permission, Mr. Chair, turn the time over to Dr. Voltura now to kind of take you through the meat of what those look like. Sure, Brad. Please do. Uh, good morning, uh, Commissioners, Chair McDaniel, Dr. Frenzlo, um, and thank you for your time today. Uh, I'd like to start by provide, providing some context for the best management practices document, and then we'll walk through some of the key points in the document with you. And as this is a, a Colorado Parks and Wildlife document, that focus is on impacts to wildlife and important habitat to Colorado. We do pr primarily address utility scale, or sometimes we refer to those as large scale solar development projects. Um, unfortunately, utility scale does not have a universal definition and it can refer to anything from one megawatt to 300, 500 megawatts. And so there is a shift to calling these maybe large scale because utilities often don't run them anymore. But either way, we used a, a cutoff of about 20 megawatts. So projects larger than 20 megawatts, we sort of refer to as these large scale or utility scale. And that was reflected in um, Brett's comments on the uh, trends is that these are the large scale. We have a larger number of small solar garden, less than 10, 20 megawatts. Um, but we see a pretty quick jump to an 80, 100, 300 megawatt projects that can take um, you know, several thousand acres of habitat. We are also primarily commenting on photovoltaic solar, so the PV solar panels. This is the currently primary uh, technology proposed in Colorado, and increasingly we do see battery storage associated with these. We do have some legacy projects and older projects on the landscape that are other technologies, but currently um, we're seeing all PV solar as proposed projects. And so most of the issues we talk about are um, applicable to both, but there are some that are really only applicable to this large scale solar. And we do try to distinguish that um, in some of the document. We do address impacts across the state. Uh, as we showed, the trends are leaning towards the Eastern Plains. However, the resource itself is very well distributed across the state, far more evenly distributed than say wind or oil and gas. So we do believe that these projects can occur in most parts of the state. And we did want the document to reflect that. And then lastly, it's organized sequentially um, in terms of how we present the best management practices, but there is a strong focus on both site selection and project development. Uh, as we believe that's 
those are the development stages where impact avoidance is most likely to be effective. Next slide, please. Well, in the next slide, we start kind of, I'll start kind of walking through the document and just hitting some of the, the more important points that kind of carry through the document. And so um, the first, the first um, part of the document is potential adverse effects. And this is the first introduction of the concept that large scale solar equates to a functional loss of habitat within the project footprint. And in that, we mean that the land will not function and support the same composition of species that were there prior to the installation of this infrastructure. And this is in part due to some fencing uh, issues that we'll discuss shortly. But this is also true for species that can access the property. So if we think of a short grass prairie um, after installation, say an open nest, an open grassland nesting bird like a mountain plover, they're not going to suddenly want to nest in the shade of a panels where predators could be hiding around every corner. Um, also think of golden eagles. Um, they're adapted to hunting on large open grasslands. So while they're very majestic, they're not very acrobatic. And so they're going to have a real difficulty trying to maneuver amongst a dense solar panel to try to hunt uh, their food mammals. So that's what we mean and that it's no longer going to function as it did beforehand. And that concept carries throughout the document. In reference to the CPUC rule on environmental impacts, this is in their section on renewable energy standard. And there, it's much longer than this, but the, the key points are that um, consultation with government agencies, and they say with appropriate government agencies, such as um, CPW, US Fish and Wildlife Service, it doesn't reference just listed species. It lists and it states explicitly both habitats and ecosystems of concern. And we do think that's a pretty important concept um, to remember during these consultations. And then another part of that rule says that the developer certifies that they did site specific wildlife surveys and that the results were used in developing uh, the project itself. And so for projects that this rule applies to, it does get them talking to CPW um, as part of that development. However, we would like to ensure much earlier consultation. And this rule doesn't really specify when they have to talk to us. Uh, the other piece in terms of the documentation and the certification, there is a range of work product that appears to meet this rule. And so we see everything from a desktop review with a single day on site to much more extensive and comprehensive site use surveys. And so we are relying fairly heavily right now on our own mapping and our own knowledge of these sites for our reviews. Uh, for emphasizing the importance of site selection um, in terms of avoiding and minimizing impacts, we do like try to identify these key resources that are best um, protected very early in the, in the project planning. Um, and we do emphasize the recommendation to avoid high priority habitats. So these are areas that CPW has already identified as of concern regarding development um, and that might be impacted if projects are um, using a lot of that habitat. So that's sort of our first one. And then we also recommend to maximize the use of disturbed lands and areas near already developed um, locations. However, you know, this is sometimes in conflict with um, other siting concerns and those include siting of the developer and of the communities themselves. Uh, next slide, please. So we've mentioned the habitat loss is our primary concern with these uh, large scale solar projects. And the broad recommendation is to minimize uh, the project footprint um, and, have, and fragmentation within the project site. However, there are things we don't know um, and yet on some of these projects, but we do say to try to maintain natural drainage patterns, try to preserve movement corridors. And these are not just migratory corridors, but those daily movements of animals moving between foraging grounds to their you know, water sources or shelter. And one of the things that we're looking at now is, and these are fairly new on the landscape, 
um, is that we don't always know how animals are going to respond to fences. Um, we don't necessarily know if they're going to avoid from a, cer a certain distance from the fence, if there's going to be other edge effects from that fencing. Um, we don't know if they'll use a corridor through a project. And if we don't know how wide that corridor has to be to be truly functional habitat, and that is going to be somewhat species specific and something again like a large open grassland you know dweller like a pronghorn who's suspicious of predators around every corner you know may not want to use a smaller corridor so how big do they need to be to be functional are animals going to move between projects that are placed close together um, and you know are they how far around these projects are they willing to go if you fence off 3,000 acres how much movement are you going to have around that facility so we're using our best available information um, and uh, these are areas we, we've identified that more data is probably needed. For study protocols and monitoring and wildlife protection, these are very site specific. And as we mentioned, this is not intended to replace those consultations. So the document very specifically says you need to be talking to local CPW staff for the details. However, we did want to include uh, some information on these topics as a preview or an overview of what developers might expect when they do see our comments. And again, to start planning early. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so construction and operational considerations, these are minimization uh, opportunities, pre-construction surveys, timing considerations, and they mostly address potential fatalities or impacts from the construction itself, not so much the project, but what happens when they get on site. And these are primarily targeting things like nesting migratory birds, nesting raptors, burrowing mammals, things that really can't get out of the way if you start bringing heavy equipment in during the breeding season. Weed management, it's our pretty standard recommendations and we do have recommendations to maintain as much native vegetation as possible. And we do see some improvements in that because some old school system, you know, progress will come in and just kind of bulldoze everything or throw gravel down to do uh, vegetation management. And most of our projects, we have not had seen those proposals and they're maintaining a fair bit of native vegetation and are doing as little ground disturbance as possible. Fencing is the issue we brought up earlier um, in regards to habitat loss and fragmentation. And I did kind of want to explain because this sometimes, this section sometimes confuses people. We would absolutely prefer these facilities to be permeable to wildlife. And these smaller solar garden community solar projects often have wildlife permeable fencing and animals can move through the project and that is a much better option. However, these large scale projects, there are security issues and whether these are federal, state, corporate requirements, every single one of them comes to us with a security fence and their minimum standards are six foot chain link with barbed wire. And all of our field staff, all of us look at that configuration and identify that it's risky to wildlife, either from entanglement, entrapment. Um, and so if security fencing is required, we request that it meet our specifications for wildlife exclusion. And that is starting with an eight foot flat panel. Our big game, apparently that's what it takes for them to decide they can't jump something. And so for safety reasons, it's a safer option. We would it's not that we're asking these to be fenced off, but if the option is security fencing, we would like a design that is safe for wildlife. And then uh, the last few sections are um, transmission line. We are seeing fairly short connections. Um, these projects are sort of trace, uh, chasing existing transmission, but we do wanna remind developers of our standard um, for siting, as well as industry standards, particularly around the Avian Powerline Interaction Committee, which is looking at collision and electrocution risk for these new uh, power lines, particularly for raptors. And we do think as a uh, transmission line kind of extends further out, we will see more projects, but right now they're looking for a short two, three mile, if that connection to existing infrastructure. The section on avian fatality risk is really looking at fatality risk from the facility itself. So in, for PV solar panels, it's essentially um, collision with the panels. And so PV solar is currently considered lower risk than concentrated solar, but there are some studies ongoing, and this is one of those where we'll kind of wait for the new information to come out. There's very little published and very little known, um, but we do know that PV solar is con considered lower risk than concentrated solar. 
Um, but we do have some monitoring recommendations for areas, particularly under migratory flyways or near waterways or where we have a lot of kind of water associated birds. Um, one of the concerns with solar is, is there a lake effect? Do they see that as a water source? And we really don't know, but we're expecting some uh, reports out this summer. And then lastly, reclamation and decommissioning. These projects tend to have power purchase agreements of about 20 to 25 years and land leases of, of maybe 40 years or more. And we really don't know at the end if they're going to just decommission these or if they're going to repower with um, new technology. But we do want to see something in place, uh, plans to return the site to its original conditions. And then that is a, a very fast kind of walk through the document. And I know the document was distributed, so you all have that. In terms of what's next, uh, we'll post these to our webpage. We'll distribute them to developers, consultants, any stakeholders that requested them. And then we'll continue to evaluate new research findings as they come in and work with other states and federal partners. We do, there's a lot of activity right now. Uh, the AFWA Energy and Policy Committee recently stood up a solar energy work group and they meet um, on Monday for the first time we'll meet. And we've already had a meeting with the Department of Energy on identifying research needs. So some of the things I talked about today that you know, we need more information on, we've identified those through uh, the Department of Energy solar offices things to look at um, for that. So we'll continue to work with other states um, and it, refine these as new information comes in. And that's all I have. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Uh, we have some questions first, Mr. Barney. Thank you, Chair. I'm curious if you've taken into consideration or have any alternate recommendations for agrivoltaics or systemic solar projects. I'll pass that one to Karen. Did you say agrivoltaic? Agrivoltaic, yes. Solar. Right. So, do you mean like where agriculture and solar can coexist? Yes, yeah, so agrivoltaic typically has uh, agricultural production or livestock range and other solar panels. Uh, and it's, it's kind of similar to systemic solar where it's over a parking lot or existing infrastructure. Just the site conditions are typically so different. I was wondering if there's alternate management practices or if you can review basically the same criteria. Yes, and that was one of the conversations with the Department of Energy. They currently have funded a fairly large project looking at the how that might look on the landscape and kind of what you would need around it. So we haven't seen that proposed anywhere in Colorado, but we do know they're looking at it and we have identified that as a significant concern um, I know agricultural leases are concerned with this and the loss of not just like habitat, but also um, agricultural access. So we have not seen that in Colorado, but I do know that the Department of Energy is looking at that. This is a follow-up, sorry, to, for clarification, are you saying that there, that you have you see that as a concern for agriculture? Because typically agricultural projects are Conducted by farmers that want to get agriculture on their property? No, the current projects that we're seeing are of concern because of the fences and because of the loss of agriculture. No, the newest one would be an would be a wonderful solution. We just don't see it being proposed yet um, as an option. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Barty. Um, Executive Director Vidra, do you want to speak to Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you so much for the presentation, Brad Karen. Um, very informative, very important. You know, big picture, um, solar is going to play a really important role in the state's goals to meet some of the greenhouse gas emission targets that's brought forward in House Bill 1261 from uh, 2019. Just want to share with you what those numbers are. And we're using 2005 numbers as a baseline 26% uh, reduction by 2025, 50% reduction by 2030. So, so having um, this analysis done on the front end, when um, potential um, uh, solar companies are, are coming to Colorado, many are already based in Colorado, say, hey, we're interested in this particular landscape for, for solar, having that information on the front end, so they're able to look at what those impacts are to wildlife. Um, it's just so important. Um, as you all know, parks and wildlife is, um, a referral agency. So any land use decision, whether it is uh, new solar uh, uh, development, a hotel, um, any kind of land use decision, 
um, parks and wildlife, you know, weighs in on uh, looking through a lens of the impacts on wildlife and uh, literally thousands and thousands of uh, um, referrals a year um, throughout the state. So I really appreciate this because I've personally been involved in some situations this year where, um, you know, the stars were kind of aligned in many ways that we thought there was a particular location that would really be great, but then um, the, the developers of the solar project weren't able to really meet some of the mitigation requirements or a recommendation. So just, again, having that fun information is just so critical to make sure these solar projects get off the, the ground. And you know, I'm a huge supporter of, of solar and renewable energy types, but we also just have to make sure we know that you know any kind of landscape can fragment um, change the landscape for, for wildlife. So uh, and it means that the developers can really you know mitigate that at the front end is what this is the big picture goal. So again, just thank you for all your work. I know we just both of you and others you know, worked a lot on this and um, and, and we're working with the governor's energy office, you know, a lot of other entities to make sure that you know, it's clear what these recommendations look like. So, so great work. Thank you. Thank you, Director Gibbs. Commissioner Schaefer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, first, uh, I'll just say give big kudos for being proactive in, in putting uh, this out there for, to act as a, a guide of sorts for the, both developers and those counties that might be requesting consultation, um, I, I think it makes a big difference in the long run. I do have a, a you know, w one question I do have is um, in 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 the the document there is uh, an aspect talking about compensatory mitigation and um, a statewide standard around that. We do have the Colorado Habitat Exchange; it has not been utilized to date. I'm wondering, you know, if there have been com conversations about um, having compensatory mitigation for solar projects um, included as part of that and sort of restanding up the, the exchange. And then secondly, there was a, a, a bill passed this year, and I'm not going to profess to understand uh, energy policy, but Senate Bill 72, which I think created a regional um, sort of authority, the RTO, um, if there's been any discussions or consultation about utilizing legislation like that to be more prescriptive in looking into sort of long-term um, opportunities about um, either being prescriptive from a policy sense on places that are good to develop, or at least being prescriptive in, in terms of telling folks where it's not good to develop and to, to avoid some of those places. Thank you, Commissioner Schaefer. Appreciate that uh, question. And I'll, I'll start there. Maybe we can ask Dr. Wilter to ask to answer the second part of that question. But with regard to compensatory mitigation, it's a great point. You mentioned it in the document. You heard some about compensatory mitigation from me yesterday with regard to Senate Bill 19181 and oil gas development and regulations that are actually in place that require compensatory mitigation in certain operators in certain, uh, in certain periods and certain times and certain places. Uh, with regard to solar, generally compensatory mitigation compliance would be voluntary on the part of an operator. At this point, there's no requirement uh, in PUC regulations or county regulations that would require compensatory mitigation. Um, we are working on a statewide standard internally on when people request that compensatory mitigation. And so that, that's in progress right now. And Commissioner Schaefer mentioned the, the habitat exchange, uh, and there are other entities that also could assist in those types of projects. And they, you know, they certainly wouldn't be precluded from those discussions. But once we ask for compensatory solar, and an operator uh, elects to go forward with compensatory mitigation project, we can plan an individual project. We can work with the habitat exchange or other groups in order to implement something that would mitigate uh, for the impacts. Uh, pretty much direct impacts with solar, um, not probably a lot of indirect impact with solar. As far as the second part of that question with uh, uh, the legislation that was passed, uh, maybe Dr. Voltura has some knowledge on that. I, uh, I don't know as much as what went into it, how much it's going to, if it's going to sort of rework the um, PUC, but we did mention there are rules within the PUC to talk to CPW, and we think those are a good framework. Um, we also know that there may be a role sort of 
lot of the, so the transmission line is driving this and we look at like Excel's, um, those that power pathway and sort of what the transmission capability for the state is, is where it's going to see more solar development. So we're sort of tracking it that way. I don't know how much it would play out. Like so we're not a regulatory agency. We are just a recommending agency. Um, and I'm not sure I need to, I want, can get into, I don't know how to get into what would I don't think we have any, we don't have any anticipation of changing that, but I would like to sort of work within those PUC rules as they exist. And I don't think that this changes any of that. Um, or I've heard that they're looking at updates, but as of right now, we're working with those existing PUC rules. But I do think there's also a role for these big utilities that are sort of driving this, you know, in terms of where they're putting the transmission and working with them on some of this as well. I, I think there's some voluntary oppor opportunities there too. Yeah, I appreciate that. Um, the only other additional comment I would say is, you know, because transmission is often driving things from the back end, um, you, you know, even providing even more information as an appendix as part of these this BMP document, because this is great. I, I think it really helps not just uh, from this the consultation of counties and operators, but also the general public of understanding the complexity of this issue. So it, it, again, big kudos. I, I really appreciate this. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I believe this document is great. It's a great starting point. I have a unique perspective on this because years ago, I've dealt with solar development companies for many, many years. Our ranch has a major electrical substation, basically, surround, or we surround three sides of this major electrical substation. The geographical layout of the ranch is very conducive to solar development. So over the past 10 years, I've dealt with dozens of development companies that are seeking to do solar projects. I have a stack of them on my desk. But that prompted me to begin the conservation use process that we did on our ranch. The main thing that I see is a lot of things, what happens in a solar development project is the project is continuing transfer. From the beginning stages to the end, you're dealing with multiple companies. And I think it's very important that the language is not ambiguous, that you have stipulations in place, such as at the end of it, most of them are 30 year, most of them I've dealt with the 30 year projects that only surface or surface use agreements. And it leaves the landowner holding the land at the end of the project after it is decommissioned. I think it's very important that. There's some sort of mechanism in place that maybe a bond is put in place so that when the project is decommissioned, the land is returned to its original condition. And there are standards in place in Colorado within RCS with many different agencies that require natural revegetation of that land. All too often, when land is revegetated, a lot of the grasses of the planet are shallow rooted, non native species that grow quickly and look really good for a couple of years. And four years down the road, that it's not just weeds and taking that over. So I don't want to go on too long, but it's very important that the language is not ambiguous, that there are stipulations in place. And always keeping in mind that the company you're dealing with today is probably not the company that you're going to deal with in six months. And it's probably not the company that's going to be there at the end of the project when it's decommissioned. So I think all of that, when I began this, we didn't have any of these documents to go by. I mean, we have threatened endangered species and a lot of project developers, it was going to impact those. And they really had no remediation or mitigation efforts in place, hadn't even thought about it, it just a project. And one thing, ours was unique in fact that they didn't need a transmission line to get to the substation, but most solar development projects do require high voltage transmission lines. And that has impacts also. One other quick thing, I see it's recommended that developers co-locate within existing easements with other high voltage transmission lines. My experience has been that nobody wants to do that. They all want their own easement. They all want their own right of way. And I think we have three high voltage lines going across the ranch right now to that substation. Every time I get a new proposal for high voltage transmission easement, I ask them to go up parallel one of the other lines and nobody ever wants to do it. So that's an issue. It sounds good to say we recommend they co-locate. I have yet to find somebody that's willing to do it. So that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner May. Commissioner Touching. Thank you, Chair. Um, 
Uh, first, uh, just to echo everyone, thank you guys for being out in front of this. Uh, I, I really appreciate it. I think this document is, is excellent. Um, I was just gonna, two of the points I was going to make have, have been raised, but um, power lines, the, the high transmission power lines drive this development. So I think it's really important to do whatever we can to get people to look at this, this document in the siting of the power line, because once the power line is there, the the solar developers are chasing the power lines, you sort of already rolled the dice. Um, and relatedly, as, as, as Commissioner May just said, on, on the tail end, I, I'd love to see a, a, a bonding um, recommendation. I know we can't do that, but maybe the counties could do their 1041 process. Um, because, you know, 30 years from now, the, the technology changes so fast and the companies also turn over. Um, I, I, you know, I, I fear that, like we've seen with other industries, they'll be abandoned and orphaned properties and, and only a bankrupt entity or a dissolved entity to look at to help clean it up. The, the other suggestion that I just wanted to um, uh, get, get any thoughts you had on this is my experience has been that um, people often look at uh, solar companies at other companies often look at the mitigation stuff after they've leased land or obtain an option, uh, an option to purchase land or even purchase the land. And how we can get them to look at this type of guidance document earlier before they send their land folks out to put stuff under lease or option. Because then they're, again, they're, they've already picked their spot and they've invested in it. And then they look at the wildlife impacts. Uh, and so I think we need to figure out how to get them to look at this when they send the letters out to folks like, like Dallas and I, you know, they should have been there, they should have seen this document before they start soliciting leases. Thank you very much, Commissioner May and Commissioner Session. Those are knowledgeable comments, and I appreciate the depth uh, um, that you put into this and say, starting with uh, Commissioner May, the transmission line issue, and then really just leads over to the uh, into the issues that Commissioner Tesla is mentioning as well. As Director Gibbs mentioned, we uh, were a commenting agency. And so it is really through uh, you know, relationships and opportunities to discuss with industry groups and their willingness to move forward and the county's willingness in most cases to move forward with any kind of reclamation plan or co-location of facilities as a non-regulatory agency we can, we can request. Um, and so we do run up against the gamut. We have a lot of uh, operators that really do want, to, in their hearts, they want to do the best thing that they can as they develop. And we, we do tend to have some success with those operators. There are others that are, uh, you know, just trying to move through a process to be cost effective. And, and we have a lot of conversations uh, with regard to that. Um, Commissioner May mentioned the co location of facility lines. And, you know, often people want to make sure that they have. You know, perpetual opportunity to maintain their own lines, and so that is a, a challenge that we have. And, and you know, just to be frank, no, no team from us to enforce that kind of a thing. But we do continue to recommend it, and we think that getting these DMPs out to people sooner uh, will be helpful. And you know, Dr. Volter is always talking to talk sooner, sooner, sooner with the agents or with the industry, and I would agree with that. She's engaged in a uh, multi-state uh, group. Uh, that's discussing solar and with, with other agencies like ours in other states, as well as uh, various trade groups. And we continue to try to, to push these uh, opportunities and ideas out as, as far in advance as we possibly can. So I, I appreciate those, that encouragement. Uh, thank you, Brad. Commissioner Adams. Yes, um, a question, and I think this might be more appropriate for Director Gibbs um, related to. Um, I was incredibly impressed um, by the presentation yesterday um, from about the oil and gas standard and just really elevating that standard um, and the, the river around that. Curious how and whether there's any conversations on uh, expanding or somehow um, bringing in the renewable energy conversation with the oil and gas so that they're not having different standards. 
um, but there's still a, a really high level. Again, I think that standard rose when we, real, when we saw that, you know, I mean, this meaningful relationship building, all those things were still resulting, right, um, in, in inappropriate and in, in, uh, in unsustainable impacts to our wildlife and, and waterways and land. Um, and so how can we learn uh, from having lax policy um, from oil and gas and really um, support this industry um, as it's moving. I will also say it is my understanding that there has been incredible accelerations over even the last five years in this industry um, to, to mitigate some of the, the issues uh, early on in the industry. However, um, I definitely echo uh, my fellow commissioners on the bond uh, as well as so that we're not taking the public isn't taking the risk on that um, as well as again, really how do we get more deep across the process? Thank you. Yeah, Commissioner Adams, that's a really that's an important point. We are having some conversations, but the, the big difference is that the DNR via the Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission, we regulate oil and gas. The DNR does not regulate you know, solar or, or wind. Um, so there is some discussion, for example, on the oil and gas, seeking you know, density stipulations and stuff that we're working with some of our federal partners on to say, for example, there can be one facility per square mile so that we're limiting, you know, the impacts to wildlife, and especially looking through the lens of well, wildlife migration corridors and so forth. Um, but we're not really having the same conversation uh, for solar. Um, and so I would almost say this is almost the first step in, in many ways to really kind of have a conversation that, you know, anything on the landscape has impact to wildlife. And um, whether we explore compensatory mitigation measures in the future to offset impacts or so forth, we're, we're starting to kind of have some of these conversations. So that's a really important point because these all have impacts. And, you know, big picture though, solar, um, you know, it, it, you know um, I don't want to say it doesn't have impacts, but it does have impacts when we look at the landscape. But uh, we're definitely moving towards more of a renewable energy. Uh, component side of things, but I don't know. Do you have anything to add on that? I, I just feel like this is on the first step of future conversations, right? Yeah, thank you, uh, Director Gedge. I think that's a really great statement. And really, and, and Commissioner Adams, I think you hit it on the head that we're kind of in this industry where we were with oil and gas, you know, quite some time ago, and that uh, we had the same kind of progression, kind of first steps and moving forward. I think we can learn from from the progression of uh, oil and gas that I think we have. You know, Director Gibbs is right on in that he has started those discussions uh, with various entities and in the, uh, in the governor's energy office. And solar, as we mentioned, and as Director Gibbs uh, pointed out right off the bat, you know, we are moving towards renewable energy worldwide. It does have a significant benefit to humans and a significant benefit to wildlife and their habitats uh, globally. But it is significant, generally, as Dr. Volterra pointed out, usually exclusionary fencing its extraction of the habitat from the local area. So you have kind of this, this two-edged sword that you're dealing with. And uh, we are in our infancy of trying to understand how we can have uh, utility-scale solar development that helps humanity, uh, you know, reduces our carbon footprint, but also uh, preserves the opportunity for existing wildlife in local areas to continue to exist. It's, it's a bit of a conundrum, and, and we are in oh, Wonderful. Thank you so much for those comments. And I also would recommend that we work with Laura Truitt and the communications team on how we can better educate the public on, uh, on what we're learning and, and really bring them along in this learning process. I've, I've already seen some miseducation out there, so I would love to. Okay. Um, I would love to get in front of that as well. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Adams. I would like to follow up on Director Gibbs' comment for just a moment. Reveal some of my past. Um, I worked at Accelerate 31 years um, for over a decade. Uh, I planned a generation portfolio for the state of Colorado for all of Excel starts. Um, and just, um, the, uh, just under the purview of the Colorado Public which I've testified about it multiple times. Um, and just to remind folks, and I know we'll bring this coming up later, but you know, we have a real opportunity for maybe that bad work we said yesterday, cooperating agency status uh, with the PC with regards to energy development. 
I will make my short commercial for selling energy while I was there. I'm proud of it. Number one in energy since 2005, across the United States, top five installer for that same period. And it's not, I don't say it just as a commercial for Excel because I'm very proud of that. Uh, but more importantly, uh, we do resource plans generally every five years. Uh, and those are continually reviewed by the PUC. And that's the real opportunity to talk about transmission development where it ends up uh, and generation development where it ends up where it ends up because included in that five year plan is not five years, but 20 plus years. And you know, what are the energy needs in the state and where might energy development occur? And of course, we're not planning specific plans and so forth for 20 years out. We'll actually do sometimes um, when, when a new generation source comes online. Uh, but it's really important and it's going to have a very long lasting, and trust me, the companies understand and all the developers understand. Uh, that that's the impact that they have. But um, the opportunity I think we have is really in that partnership somehow with the PUC and the Governor's Energy Office, which is a really tight partner with all the developers and the utilities um, in Colorado to do exactly that. So anyway, the question I was trying to get at is uh, Mr. Adams' question is where could we do that? Um, and I think there's an opportunity to do that to, to create some kind of coalition between environmental regulatory uh, wildlife interests and talk more not about this more I call it surgical approach which is site specific I think the work that you all have done is excellent uh, and that guideline really needs to be put out but there's an additional opportunity before that uh, in this planning process which actually sets that footprint much before those specific proposals come to light uh, and that's um, something we can really do in all uh, I have a few more comments, but I'm going to hold those because I know there's more later. So I'll give it to Commissioner Buck. Well, thank you, Chairman. <laughs> um, I also want to thank uh, Brett and Dr. Volterra for talking with me about this um, a couple of years ago when I really, when I moved to Eastern Plains and I would drive by this one specific um, solar installation regularly, and I never really paid attention to what the infrastructure looks like around that. And um, I was pretty, I'll say alarmed, um, knowing where, where the trend is going and um, how impactful it is to the landscape. But this is encouraging that this is happening. But I just kind of want to make the comment and then I have a question about, you know, we talk about the impact to habitat and landscapes in the mountains in the, in the urban corridor, which is often development. This industry is coming to the Eastern Plains almost exclusively. And this is, this is the, I don't use the regret, but this is gonna be the impact. And that we're having this conversation that there is room within the industry to do better, to make it less exclusory. I don't even know if an option. Because really, if you look at one, it's like scorched earth underneath, you know, plants, animals, sun, rain, like there's nothing allowed. And so I hope that there's some room for um, better technology or infrastructure along the way um, so that we don't blanket the Eastern Plains. Um, with that being said, I was curious to know if um, Director Gibbs, when we're talking about those benchmarks to me, you know, percentages, is there acreage? A lot like is there an acreage amount attached to those benchmarks? Like we need like you know, say I'm making this up like fifty thousand acres to make this thirty percent reduction. Like are there hard numbers associated with this at all? Um and then I'll just thank you. Yeah, good question. There, there, there are no hard numbers for acreage because you can achieve greenhouse gas emissions in a variety of different ways. So it's not installed out in that kind of detail. I'm sorry, one more thing. Um, and the other thing I think that maybe we should consider, however, whoever is listening, is that maybe as these, um, as this industry is coming to our communities, um, the Eastern Plains especially, maybe local government and counties can start looking at maybe places that would be in everybody's best interest. So when the, when they, when the knock is at the door, you already have a place that's maybe suitable that and I don't know how to engage that conversation and it's putting out there. So thank you. 
Well, I wanted to address the Mission Lee's comment to uh, <laughs> turn it over to him. <laughs> uh, there are regional transmission organizations, um, um, Cal ISO, SDP. Uh, there's, there's others in the Midwest, uh, MISO, and so forth. So, transmission is a whole different animal than generation is. And it's uh, here in the state of Colorado, it's regulated by the PUC, but there's also regional organizations which have regular, I'll call it regulatory site authority. Uh, so it's much different, but you all are exactly right. It lays out the, the backbone for where generation will occur because obviously developers want to site their, their generation as close to transmission as possible because they pay for the extension. Uh, or the upgrade to the transmission line if additional voltage is going to be carried on that line. So that's another whole different planning process than the generation planning process is. And another opportunity, perhaps, uh, for us to engage, because again, those are also planned, you know, much in the future to meet the energy needs of, you know, all the citizens of the state of Colorado. And, and actually the region, uh, because generally the transmission is turned into a regional planning process versus the state specific planning process, uh, which I, you know, adds more complexity to it. But Commissioner, you have comments? I, I very much appreciate your experience on it, Mr. Chair. I, I think I understand that we are working on a recommendation policy and the agency is rec making recommendations. But it, I don't think we should discount that because I've been in so many County 1041 hearings that the CPW recommendations are brought in and wielded as a weapon against wildlife and wildlife habitat. Because, for example, I'll get on my soapbox. There are places, and I can only speak personally in mind, that if this development, if it's a private company, you have some control. But at some point, you begin to deal with the public utility and the rights of condemnation come into place. And you, for example, have some, some habitat that can't be replaced. Mitigation is easy to talk about, but there is no mitigation for, for example, so a marshland or some emergent wetlands that there's just not replacement for them. I mean, they are so rare right now that they can't be replaced. So mitigation to me should not even be part of the process. It should be more of a, uh, working around that. And I think as we craft this policy and craft this document, it's very important that we craft it in a way, like I said earlier, that there are stipulations that we at least are recommending. And recommending the county place bonds on this for decommissioning is one of the main things. But the counties will have this and have our recommendations to go by. And it gives us at least the opportunity to protect. I know a lot of these places or some of these projects could be big enough that it may be an environmental impact study at least remember there are issues in place that we can't discount. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Do you want to make a comment? Yeah, I just had a follow-up just thinking about Commissioner Lucas um coming kind of on acres. Um one thing that everyone should know that you know state land board is, is one of the DNR's you know divisions. And that actually consists of about 4% of the whole land mass in Colorado, uh, 2.8 million acres. And so we're going through a process right now of looking at the state land board land, figuring out like, hey, what, what figures may be appropriate for solar? So I think that's really exciting. It's not gonna be on all the acres, of course, but, but there may be some parts in Colorado uh, that would be suitable on those lands. So I just want to let you know in terms of acres. Yeah, thank you. Um, I to follow up with you. Um, I, I just want to bring up a couple of points, which I, I think, again, it's a rare opportunity you guys can take this, you know, uh, as my last meeting, take it there and do what you want with it. But there's a lot of things going on. I mean, it's a tremendous balance between how can we provide more minimum energy and use carbon uh, and have the least impact, you know, on wildlife habitat and wildlife in Colorado. Uh, for example, when you know, how do you be more efficient when taller towers and bigger blades? And of course, taller towers and bigger blades have more of an EV impact. Um, and then, of course, expansion of solar, a bigger footprint. Uh, solar gives more capacity versus energy, uh, much more than wind does. It's mostly wind goes at night. 
well, it's focused on the machine, the majority of major machines are still uh, after dark. So um, it's, you know, and, and, and being able to, to, to build and tilt, I think you used to tilt the scale of solar, a lot of solar and, and wind development brings the cheapest energy to our citizens. And that's why it's so efficient. And, you know, there's that balance between that. But I think we could do, you know, a great service uh, to our state by outlining, starting with, you know, where are our, our wetlands we want to protect? So let's let's talk about what some of the stuff that's, I won't, maybe I won't use the term off limits, but, you know, you should use all possible ways to avoid, you know, migration corridors, wintering habitat, cabin grounds, wetlands. You know, these are the things where we know these things today, just like the energy developers know where the transmission lines are. And we can lay these things out today and say, you know, if, you know, along these transmission paths, here's areas perhaps you might not want to go get an option on a piece of land to develop because there's a wetland right there that we're going to, you know, probably take issue with. So maybe ship 10 miles to the left or 10 miles to the right or north or south. Um, and I think they would welcome that. I, I really do. I think they'd welcome that kind of input because that makes it easier for them. They certainly don't want to fight uh, uh, in front of a commission with regards to it. You know, they want a smooth project that goes in, um, that would be easy to uh, continue developing and come to fruition. So my suggestion is uh, sit back and say, let's go, let's take one step back from that site specific, which is great work, and perhaps do a more strategic approach to our state. And I mentioned this before with regards to trails. It's the same thing for me with trails. We already know where all the migration corridors are, the wintering grounds and so forth are. So where in our state, in the national forests or state parks, do we not want trails? Or trails to expand and say these areas are kind of off limits. So if you're thinking about trails, I'm not against trails, but I am against trails that go through calving grounds during the spring. And if you do propose one in there, recognize that that one's going to be closed from X month to Y month, that kind of thing. So anyway, I'm going to get off my horse now about that uh, and uh, leave you with those remarks as I as I leave the commission. So Commissioner Phillips. Thank you, and I, I think that makes a lot of sense, uh, Chair McDaniel. Um, and then going back to Dallas and um, Commissioner Blanca, um, and a lot of the stuff I've seen around our home, um, a lot of the solar, it's, it's a good thing, uh, mid-term, long-term. I, I really believe that, but at the moment, at least from my experience, it seems like a bit of a gold rush. Uh, a lot of companies around, a lot of people moving, you know, to, to capitalize on X density or cheap ground, whatever it might be. And a result, we see a lot of um, solar farms go up and and not quite abandoned, but not maintained. Um, fences flying over, um, panels not tracked in sun. Just and I don't know much about it, but I can tell they're in disrepair. Uh, so I think a lot of that goes to maybe a, a partner selection uh, part of this uh, presentation, um, outlining you know. Just like removing some areas that we don't want to get into them, but but putting down some boundaries of what we expect out of our partners. Uh, the bonding thing uh, at the end, uh, not suggesting wildlife fencing, but making that part of it, uh, and just kind of set the tone for a good experience from the beginning until the end of the process. Um, solar is a really long-term outlook. It's a benefit for our, our planet, I think, to reduce carbon emissions. Um, so selecting the right partners, I think, is imperative, and not something that I've seen in our area. Not they're not all bad, but there are some out there, and they really show through. That's more of a comment. That's an excellent comment. I tell you, the teeth in that come in the contracting process, Commissioner Phillips. None of them are selling to the consumers. They're selling to co-ops and they're selling to utilities. And um, the ability to enforce them to do or force them and enforce that is life in that contract. And so again, that's kind of guidance you could give to say this is what's necessary. So you know, energy development in the state of Colorado. And again, we don't regulate it. 
but you know, give them ideas about what we think is the right thing to do to protect wildlife habitat and, and wildlife resources uh, in our state. And maybe they will pick that up and include that as contract provisions that need to be, um, you know, included in those contracts because they're for a very long time. We all know there are 20, 30 year facilities. And who knows who will own them five years, five months out from you know the contract, which is good. But if it's in there, they can enforce it. Mr. Chair, just allow me to follow up on that. To expand on your thoughts, I agree 100%. Uh, my experience, by the time the landman contacted me, they had already spoken with the county officials. They had gone through, they look at the properties from the satellite. That's what they look at. And if we as an agency come up with some sort of a system that would have GIS layer or something that would identify this property as they're looking at it as, well, granted, this fits this criteria for you, but it also is going to include these complications and maybe it's totally off limits because there is no mitigation in place for this property. Like you have said, with an emergent wetland or some areas like that, and many, many groups, Audubon, for example, has a lot of these identified that are irreplaceable. There's no mitigation possible for them. So if we could in advance have that layer to where as they're going through the process and they come across this property they're interested in, they see, oh, really, there is no possible mitigation for the replacement of that wildlife habitat. I think it would be helpful because every time I talk to somebody, I'd have to get a few conversations down the road and we hit this roadblock. But if it would have been up in front, you probably could save everybody a lot of effort, a lot of resources. Thank you, Commissioner Mayor. Commissioner Dyson. And then I'm probably going to have to push, push this along because I maybe more I'm trying to keep coming short, my own fault for rambling on. I was thinking my last opportunity. Uh, uh, but we'll move along falling apart behind our team. Thank you, Chair. <laughs> I kind of echo what everyone said, but I want to follow up on a couple of things. I think the bonding is extremely important, um, as we've seen with oil and gas. Um, solar is also a very changing technology. It's moving. Um, we have tons of abandoned wells with oil and gas. I see the same thing happening with solar. So I think we need to protect ourselves somewhere because this is actually. I believe a larger footprint on the land than the oil and gas wells themselves, especially the larger developments. Um, and I would like to, what um, Commissioner Burney was talking about, uh, what do you call agri, agri Okay. Okay. Um, I've seen some of that. Guys have come in, they have it in gender, and um, it's actually really neat the way that they set that up. But that would be less of a footprint on the land as far as habitat loss, we can maybe not have as much fencing. I'd like to see us put that in the document as a suggestion that they look at that. Because um, I do think it would help for all the things on the ground. Um, you could graze it, birds could live there, fly under it. Um, it would help in a lot of ways, I believe. And I also think that um, what um, Commissioner May and all of you said really, Migration corridors, flyways, um, that should be a part of it where they shouldn't be in those spots. There should be other areas where they should be able to put those. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Thank you, Chair. I'll be quick. Um, I just, one comment that uh, uh, I lost track of at least was that we have a mitigation system in the works, but we, we haven't quite. Finished it, but it, it, or you know, but but I again just on my own experiences, solar developers are, are often looking to be green, and they love to be able to mitigate their impact. Um, we just have to make it easy for them, and so I, you know, in my experience is like they'll write a check, but they don't want to do a lot. They don't want to hire a consultant, and so. Uh, if we can make like a mitigation bank or something like that on, on the ground that they can, you know, and I agree with Dallas, there's some things you can't mitigate and writing a check isn't the same thing as restoring lost habitat. 
but it's the option we have sometimes. And so, but we just need to make it easier for them to, you need to mitigate, here's, here's what you do, and this is the program, and write your check, and you get your credits, and you can go forward. Uh, so it's just uh, something I think we should get in place to make it easy. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, I think that's it. Um, probably have more input than you were seeking, Brad. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks for allowing the time to uh, you know, really start the conversation. We will continue to work hard on this. And uh, as Derek did point out, we still have a lot of coordination work ahead of us. Thank you so much for uh, sharing your thoughts. And thank you very much. I think it's awesome the passion and interest this commission has in this topic. I know you all carry this look forward. Uh, Katie, I suggest we change our schedule. It's 940. Since we're kind of broken up here a little bit, let's go to break now at 940 and just take 10 to 950 and then go straight to you and then follow with uh, Andy Hoffman, if that's all right. Thank you. So with that, uh, adjourn, a temporary adjournment, take a break here for 10 minutes. Be on. <laughs>
Thank you. I'm at Dream Z, the Friday, June 11th meeting of the Colorado Water Policy Commission uh, in Trinidad. With that, we will move forward to item number let's see, 19, and it's Jay Lander, who's our policy and planning supervisor, to talk about big game license allocation and preference points in the public involvement timeline. So, yeah. Here's something that I didn't do in the last meeting, and it's carrying this forward. So, welcome. Jay. Thank you, Chairman Daniel. Commission, it's good to see you again today. I'm Katie Lancer, Policy Planning Supervisor with Colorado Parks and Wildlife. And yeah, there was a request at the last commission meeting to come back and, and bring to you a little bit more detail about the public engagement timeline that we see for, for considering changes to the game uh, license allocation and preference point policies and regulations. Uh, Kirk, next slide, please. So we more or less envision a phase process uh, for public and stakeholder involvement, and that would inform the proposed changes. And we feel like this approach will gather qualitative and quantitative data on public attitudes and offer multiple channels to capture the voices of resident and, and non-resident hunters with attention towards an inclusive process. And I'll get into a little bit more detail about each of these phases. So next slide, please, Kirk. Uh, the first phase was basically between now and the end of the year, and with the identifying and refining topics for the meeting attitude survey by conducting focus groups. Uh, so first off, uh, this summer, we would meet our internal group and consult with partners, uh, particularly on our approach for engaging BIPOC and underserved communities. Then uh, we would work on the, the focus group design in the August, September timeframe. And then in October, November would be when we would conduct the focus groups. And we envision that would include focus groups on with resident hunters, non-resident hunters, outfitters, new and prospective hunters, and BIPOC and underserved communities. And then at the end of the year, we would, uh, you know, finalize the, the survey, taking into account the information that we had gathered during the focus groups. Next slide, please, Kirk. The phase two then would kick off at the beginning of 2022, and that would be scaling up our, our public outreach with conducting the Big Game Attitude Survey that would happen between January and April of next year. We'd also collect public comments uh, using a modified version of the, the survey questions, and we feel like that two-pronged approach would give us statistically valid results from the random sample survey while also allowing interested hunters to provide input. We would bring the results from the survey and the public comment back to the commission in June of next year. Uh, and then from that point on, we'd do some uh, more stakeholder outreach uh, to inform the development of draft alternatives. So we envision that would be some stakeholder workshops as well as uh, public meetings. Next slide, please. And then that would carry us into phase three, the development of draft alternatives. So we would do that based on the input that had been gathered through the course of that summer. And then we envision coming to the commission uh, in a, at least a two-step regulatory process in September and November. Uh, you know, whether changes are implemented then for the 2023 or the 2024 seasons, I think it depend on the complexity of the changes um, and, and, when, and the exact timing of when regulations are approved. Uh, so with that, that's really all I have to present and welcome any questions or comments. Thank you very much, Katie. Any questions or comments with regards to Commissioner Tushin? Uh, thank you, Chair. So this is my first go around with a big game survey. Uh, and I, well, let me just tell you where I'm coming from. Uh, we, there's a bit of a dilemma uh, in that uh, we serve the residents of Colorado as a commission. Residents vote for the elected officials who appoint us. Non-residents are frankly paying most of our bills, at least as far as the financial, which is a pretty rudimentary understanding, but that gives us a dilemma between the people we serve and the people who are, are paying uh, our bills. And so if, if the survey goes forward, I, I think a key question is if, if residents want a greater chance at some of these hunting opportunities, if we ask them if they're willing to pay more to let us work this out. And so I, I know that's a tricky question, but I just wanted to make sure it was included in the uh, discussion. It's part of the survey itself. Yeah, thank you for that. I think that's something that we can look at. Yeah, because we do anticipate there will be differences of attitudes between residents and non-residents, and and then that will ultimately, I think, come down to the policy decisions of the commission of, of how you want to handle those preferences from the from the public. Thank you. 
Thanks for asking. Um, I just want to follow up on what Smith and said. Um, the price of being in a non resident fees and ours are, are um, done through the legislature. That's not something that we can change. So you can ask, but it's not necessarily something that we can do. <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> Curious how. Um, Current or existing gatherings or convenings can be leveraged, um, specifically the regional sports person caucuses um, and other convenings. Um, and this goes back to an issue I've raised a couple of times around stakeholder engagement. And uh, although I appreciated the uh, overview of stakeholder engagement, it would be incredibly helpful to get uh, an updated list or a report or an overview of the current projects that are required or for including stakeholder engagement, um, the types of stakeholders or user groups that are involved, the timeline, right? Um, as I said, I, I mentioned stakeholder fatigue as an issue, uh, particularly for historically excluded or marginalized or underrepresented groups who are getting multiple touch points and don't necessarily always have the capacity um, as some others who actually are working for organizations that support their time to attend meetings, et cetera. So I really want to be mindful of that. I also wanted to raise um, a, a comment around equitable research practices, uh, which includes ensuring uh, racial and ethnic, uh, racially and ethnically diverse research teams, uh, especially when um, working and trying to gauge information from uh, racially and ethnically diverse groups. So again, um, wanting to recognize the importance of uh, being inclusive of the incredibly extensive uh, research of um, racially and ethnically diverse uh, team, um, and we don't have uh, that racially and ethnically diverse uh, research in our researchers in our agency. Uh, and so, making sure that we're partnering or consulting um, somewhere to get that representation. So, again, um, a question and a comment. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Adams. Uh, yeah, I think we envision in a couple of the phases different ways that we can, uh, as you mentioned, go to others, you know, not necessarily expecting them to come to us uh, for the engagement purposes. So with the development of the focus groups, we've started some initial discussions with uh, the Theodore Roosevelt Conservation Partnership. Uh, they are work, uh, have staff that are engaged in a, a Latino uh, sports persons group. So, so getting their input to help us uh, with the, the focus group design and possibly the conducting of, of focus groups as well. Um, and then in that uh, phase two process where we would do it, be doing um, stakeholder meetings and public meetings, uh, there again, we thought, yes, let's use the groups that, that we have, things like our sports persons round table and, uh, so that uh, it would be a big story. I mean, some of it is opportunities that we would put forward where people could, could come to us, but also, uh, as you mentioned, going to them. Uh, and there's also, uh, in terms of the, the focus group and the survey design, uh, DNR has, as I understand it, could be an EDI group. And uh, that was another resource that we thought that we could go to um, to, to bring in more of the uh, perspectives that you mentioned. Right. And again, I appreciate those efforts. And I, I wanted to be specific that there's actual researchers who are racially and ethnically diverse who can do these statistical analysis, et cetera, and ensure that the reporting is appropriate. Um, we have seen issues where we, when there isn't that representation. We've looked at previous reports on hunting in the 90s. Um, and there was no reference of any issues of safety by Black people, Black hunters who were part of the study. And as a emerging Black hunter, I was like, that's not possible. <laughs> I, I definitely would have said something. And that was a concern of mine when I uh, went out for my first hunt uh, earlier uh, this season. So uh, again, that one, and I wanted to also elevate Hunters of Color, which is a new organization uh, that former uh, CPW staff, Crystal, Crystal Eggly, uh, informed me about, uh, and I've been uh, and, uh, more actively participating. So I think they'd be a wonderful group to support this work. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. Uh, Commissioner Schaefer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> uh, and thank you, Katie, for coming back with more detail. I think it's um, really helpful to understand uh, what the scope of this process will be. Um, like, you know, some of the other big initiatives that we're working on, uh, I think there's plenty of folks that want it to move more quickly and other folks that want a more, more you know, inclusive process. I, I think that, you know, realistically, um, 
these problems have both been going on for, for quite a while, what, whether we're talking about allocations or preference points, um, or, you know, what, what exactly this ends up including is, is in terms of the issues in the gamut um, will be informed by that big game attitude survey. And uh, we, we need to hear from, from everyone, um, non-residents, residents. Um, I, I think that the more inclusive this process is, that the better we understand what are the exact issues that we need to address in this process. Um, and, and as we've seen, that there's not a, any decline in interest. Uh, we, we saw a 15% increase in, you know, applications for for deer, for instance, and what we're seeing, you know, that compounding some of the preference point issues that uh, or exacerbating them that, that have existed for quite a long time. Um, so I. You know, I, I think that this, um, while, while I would love to be able to, you know, um, get the results of this and, and, and implement them uh, in an earlier season date than, you know, potentially 2023, it makes far more sense for us to, to, to be um, really cognizant of the complexities of the issues and, uh, and make sure that we're hearing from everyone. So uh, I really support um, what you all have developed and appreciate the work on it. Thank you, Commissioner Schaefer. Um, seeing no other questions or comments at this time, I had my own. Commissioner Schaefer and I have spoken about this multiple times with regards to this process. I'm really excited about it personally. Um, thank you for bringing it forward. And uh, I'm hoping, and I think our my fellow commissioners really understand the magnitude of this work you're about to undertake. Um, both in its complexity and its controversy that will come out of it. Um, and we think that some of the things we handle are pretty controversial. Wait till you see the outcome of this survey and some of the recommendations uh, that might come from it. Um, I would just like to repeat the comments I made the other day, Katie, and that is, and, you know, I'm hopeful that the survey will include um, questions with regards to quality of experience that, that our sports people here in, in Colorado are looking for. Is it more that we're providing opportunity uh, or is it more of a quality experience? And then aligning that with, of course, you know, maybe uh, questions about are they going to take less opportunity to, you know, help us improve habitat, maintain healthier herds and so forth in the state. And, uh, and in return for that, you know, they might not get a license every year, um, but the experience that you get will, will do get will be fantastic here in our state. Um, and you know, maybe there's other areas that they can get a license every year, but the experience is much harder, you know, and their effort will be much harder. So again, now I'm speaking words that will ignite, I'm sure, more comments <laughs> with regards to this process and beginning it. But congratulations on beginning it, Katie. Uh, and uh, I, I don't you know, um, I, I don't look forward to, to going to do it. So uh, I'm sure maybe not all of you do <laughs> uh, look forward to it, but uh, it'll be a tough one, but it'll be well worth it. And it's at a critical point in the state where our population is increasing so much that it is really necessary. Uh, and it's gonna bring a lot of questions into play. So thank you. Um, with that, that concludes uh, item 19, I believe, maybe. Um, item 20 is public comment, and at this time, we have no public comment uh, commenters uh, that have signed up either virtually or uh, willing to appear in person. So we'll move forward to item number 22, which is Andy Hong, Big Game Manager, and he's going to give us a discussion around the Big Game Auction and Raffle Program. This is an action item. He's seeking approval of the Conservation Organization Evaluation Criteria. Uh, and this is a step one of one, so he will present it and for us to debate it and then take action on it at today's meeting. So Andy, I'll turn over to you once they queue up your presentation. Looks like they're done.
seconds. Thank you. Good morning, commissioners, Chairman McDaniel, Deputy Director Kudnick. I'm Andy Holland, the CDW Big Game Manager. And another component of my job duties are as the Oxygen Raffle Program Manager. So today I'm going to be giving you a background, some background information on the Oxygen Raffle Program. And then, as Chairman McDaniel said, the action item for the day is to approve evaluation criteria that we will use to make contract awards um, recommendations for author that you will authorize in September. So just a brief background here, because there's been an evolution of statutes over the years. This program is authorized by statute um, 334116 and Parks and Wildlife Commission Regulation 229. The program began in 1989 with Big Horn Sheep and Mountain Goat licenses. We added moose in 1996, and then deer elk and problem were added in 2001. And then the final, um, or I shouldn't say final, the latest evolution in the legislation was new statutes and regulations tweaking the program, I guess we'll say, in 2006. And one of the things that I wanted to emphasize with this slide is that our conservation organization partners have been integral to this entire process. So they're not only partners in auctioning and raffling the licenses with us, they were instrumental in the inception of the program. The photos of the original legislation signed by the governor is surrounded by the concert, many of the conservation organizations that we now currently have contracts with. So I, I, I can't, I can't uh, overstate their involvement in, in, even back to the, act, the actual creation of the program. So the, the current makeup that we have with these 18 licenses are nine auction and nine raffle. And I want to emphasize also, I think, the importance of having a companion raffle for every auction license, for every license that someone with means can purchase. There's one, there's a, a companion license that once issued is identical in terms of privileges that somebody can win in a raffle with a $25 um, ticket. And currently we have one auction and one raffle each for Rocky Mountain Goat, I'm sorry, Rocky Mountain Big Orange Sheep, Mountain Goat, Moose, and two auction and two raffle each for deer, elk, and prong. As far as the licenses and hunters, the appeal of these licenses is they're, state, they're valid statewide in any unit open to hunting that species, and they have extended, extended seasons. So once a season is open in any given unit for that species, then the season is continuous and longer than our regular season structure. For revenue, we've raised a total of 4.3 million in the last five years. Last year's revenue uh, total was 908,000. Currently, this year, we're at 950,000 with one auction and one raffle left to go. So unless something really strange happens, we should exceed 1 million in, in gross revenue for the first time ever in the program this year. Which is a good thing because all the costs of wildlife management, as you know, are going up. In particular, habitat enhancement costs are going up astronomically. The, the picture on the left here is in the Arkansas River drainage, and it's a hydroax project, which is like an, uh, an attachment to a tractor that's a lawnmower. Think of a lawnmower that's so powerful that it can mow trees. That's, that's pretty remarkable, actually. But they cost a lot to run and maintain. And so what, what that picture shows is they mowed those trees, those feeding and juniper trees, which lets light more light into the ground. It raises the water table because those trees are no longer sucking a lot of water. And between that light and water, more forage shrubs and grasses are able to grow. And in this case, it's for deer and elk forage. So it's a deer and elk project. The one on the right is a prescribed fire which are less costly per acre, but they come with their own challenges, as you can imagine. The, this project in particular, the objective was to burn all of this pinion juniper around these cliffs 
to set the stage for a bighorn sheep transplant into that area, which we eventually did after the habitat improvement set the stage for that. So my, my point of this is one, this is one of the uses of the funds, but also we need the funds because everything is getting more expensive. This, this slide shows the, the, rev, the total gross revenue, and I'll get into why I'm emphasizing gross here in a minute. But this slide shows the total gross revenue. The blue line is total revenue generated with the 18 licenses. You can see for the last 10 or 12 years, the revenue has been increasing um, remarkably. The red line is auction only. Last year, some of the auctions prices did go down due to the uncertainty with COVID-19 and the bankers were canceled. And so that, that decline there is, I would call that a COVID-19 effect. This year, as I said, there's one deer auction remaining, which should go for around $100,000. So we should see um, a total gross after that 25th auction, that June 25th auction of about right here where my curves are suffering. So the auction revenue will then flip back up. That's my prediction. We'll see what happens. And then the green line is raffle revenue. And you can see raffle revenue has been steadily increasing. Um, people are, as, just like our demand, like we just talked about, the demand for hunting licenses is increasing. The demand for, for these you know, pre, uh, primo opportunities is also increasing. And just because uh, just I, I, you always have to throw out a couple wild vector figures. This year, this year we've broken, I think every raffle, uh, what we have, you can see from the green line, We've broken every raffle record in terms of generated per license. And this year, the Bighorn Sheep auction license went for a record of 180,000, which was 50,000 more than the previous record. And um, a fact that I think is pretty cool, for the first time ever, the raffle revenue for Bighorn Sheep exceeded the auction. Um, our partners generated 188,000 for that one cheap raffle license. And then the record for a deer license is 130,000. So which of course is a lot for a species you can hunt generally every year. So that's fantastic. So the next slide shows um, some more about how we use these funds. As I mentioned, habitat enhancement is a primary important um, function with these, with these funds, but we also use it for research management and education. You can see in the, the lower left here, that's moose research. And the, the center photo is a desert bighorn sheep transplant funded with auction raffle funding. And then on the right, I think you heard about this, some of these projects yesterday. On the right is uh, the, the elk calf research to try, and, to try and determine why our elk calf ratios are declining. So all these things are hugely important. These funds are critical. Um, uh, one critical component of funding these, these valuable projects. We have a project advisory committee. The, that committee is made up of the groups that have contracts for these licenses. And so they work hard to generate these funds. And so they have a seat at the table at determining how those funds are spent. And so this works uh, very mutualistically between the organizations and ourselves. And um, we, that committee, in addition to the groups, is made up of federal land management agencies, U.S. Forest Service, and BLM, and Parks and Wildlife. And so that committee makes funding recommendations to the CPW director, which um, Director Prenzo just approved the 2021 funding uh, just a few days ago. So a little more about the groups. As I mentioned, these groups have contracts to auction and raffle these licenses for us. They must return at least 75% of the gross proceeds to CPW. They can retain up to 25% of the proceeds and, and use those for, use the, that 25% for, um, for the expenses of conducting the auctions and raffles or funding projects of, um, funding projects of their own and they like i said they serve on the advisory committee and that that creates an interesting um that creates an interesting process in that they know because they're on our project advisory committee what our funding priorities are and what projects we're funding and so often with the retained 25 percent of the funds they often have their own processes to solicit proposals 
and their board approves funding that are often the same projects that we're funding with our 75%. So if that makes sense, a lot of the projects are the same, the, the money that they retain funds the same projects. So to kind of drill down with our getting more into our action item today and shifting a little less out of the information item, there's this, this whole process of awarding these contracts is a, is a two phase process. The first phase is today. And as we've said, uh, this approves the evaluation criteria that we're using the RFP to solicit proposals for the license contracts. Once we have those evaluation criteria approved today, DNR will, will send out an RFP to solicit bids for those contracts. We'll have a joint DNR CPW evaluation team that will evaluate those proposals and make recommendations to the commission to authorize those contracts at the September commission. And the reason that this time is so specific is these auctions start in January. And so because of the commission, the commission meeting schedule, we wanna make sure that we have first the contracts and procurement section has time to, award, to write up an award and get signatures on these contracts. And, and then we need the groups to have ample time to market these licenses starting in January. And so with that, I'll dive right into the, the evaluation criteria. The first criteria, and, and these were in the memo that our team sent you. Um, these are just bullet points. These are just bullet points referencing, referencing each of the criteria. Um, the full language as recommended is in the memo, but I'll, I'll summarize them here. Uh, criterion A is organizational information. This is not scored. This is just fit for our information on the team. The, the second criterion it be a statutory requirements and the statute, the statutory requirements are they must be a nonprofit directly involved in conservation in Colorado. And we use the, their mission statement and their um, tax previous tax returns 5013 C status to evaluate and that's on a past sale basis. And then C is their experience and ability to maximize revenue for the state and wildlife conservation. D is use of funds, and that's not only the percent funds that they are going to retain, because while they can retain up to 25%, they don't have to retain 25%, and some groups choose to retain less and give more back to the state. And, and then in addition to that, how they are proposing to use their retained portion of the funds. E is not scored, but it's a great aid in our, in our committee, and that's the licenses requested. And so, as you can imagine, uh, a mule deer focused conservation group would put their top priority as the mule deer license. And that's what their members are most interested in. And that's where they're going to get the most, generate the most interest. And so we, we, we on, the, on the proposal or on, on the RFP, they will check the boxes of all the licenses they're interested in in order of their interest. And so that allows the committee to to move licenses around to sort of to try and meet everybody's top priorities. And then F is, um, I, I guess I did a little bit into F already, organizational focus, and we use our mission statement to, to clarify that. And then finally, um, proposed fundraising, and that's their fundraising plan. I'm used to trains, we have them in Fort Collins. <laughs> And so uh, that's the uh, fundraising audio effects that you had in the presentation. It is. You know, this is really a video <laughs> after conclusion. <laughs> and, that, and that concludes my presentation. So from there, we can head into any questions, discussion, and then your um, review of those criteria. We probably should maybe focus more on the memo and get into details. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. And thank you. And and Andy and I talked about this a bunch in the meeting. And the first time he's had, I mean, I, I think we're doing an excellent work with the funds raised in this manner. Uh, last commission meeting, um, Dallas and I were both uh, uh, bragging about how uh, and I and Jonathan Wright, who is planting sumac. And uh, I learned subsequently that Jonathan is buying those sumacs with money raised from this program. So I've seen the on the ground benefits. Uh, of, of, of this program. Um, I, I do have um, uh, one concern and then uh, a sort of a, a, a suggestion for how we what it might address it, which is there's, a, there's 18 total licenses 
Um, but three organizations get 13 of the, the total. One organization gets five, and then two organizations get four each. And, and my concern is that we, we try to spread that around to some more organizations. And, and they're sort of the one criteria that I focus on is the one that judges their experience and track record. And it, it's, you know, to get new organizations in the program, they won't necessarily have the experience or the track record. So, you know, unless we give them a chance, they'll never be able to satisfy that criteria. Uh, and so my suggestion to get a few more organizations involved, and, and you know, not to take anything away from the people who've been selling these licenses, but you know, they, it is only a, well, 13 of them go to three organizations. Uh, that, that we might say after an organization has one or two, that they go down the preference list unless something is not uh, otherwise asked for. So that we try to, you know, because this, this the program is a benefit both to us, but also to the organization, it increases their prestige, their ability to invite folks to a banquet that we think is option to raffle. And so I'd like to figure out how we might tweak those criteria to see if we can get a few more participants. That's, that's good. And it, yeah, a comment that might help with that concern um, is that in the last RFP, every group that sent a proposal in received a license contract, at least one, if not multiple. So it's not like, um, and, and I didn't say this, there's a lot of details I, I skip over, but the last go around five years ago, everybody who submitted a proposal got a license. So it's not like 75 groups submitted and we only gave the licenses to the the three because they had a proof track record. So I don't know if that helps, but um, that definitely, we didn't leave anybody out of that, is what I'm saying. And, and, and as long as they meet the criteria of the statutory minimum criteria of nonprofit organizations directly involved in conservation in Colorado, um, then they are, they're, very, they're very competitive on this. You know, on this. And yeah, we could bring in some, some new people into the, the project advisory committee that would bring different conservation um, orientation and thoughts and that would be that would be welcome so yeah I, I hope that that alleviates that concern and, and i will add one more thing about those groups that you mentioned that have a lot of raffle licenses there's two components to that first of all raffles are a lot of work and the, the auctions are generally a more desirable because they bring in as you said they bring in a lot of interest to their to their banquet it elevates the status of that banquet it's a feather in their cap and it's one auctioneer for five minutes of that for that license. The raffles are a lot of work. They, they spend a lot of effort bringing in the money to sell thousands of tickets and 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 just accounting for all that. You know, it's just a much more labor intensive. And there's a few organizations that have excelled at really not, really generating a lot of revenue on their raffles. And so and they work hard at it. And so there's a little bit of economy of scale in that if you're doing the raffle anyway. Adding one more species doesn't add all the marketing costs and everything that, that just doing the raffle for one species would do. So there's a little bit of economy of scale for the organizations in that. Uh, thank you. Follow up on that. So the, would you say that the hurdle with regard to the number of applicants in the past is around probably the conservation requirement that the organization primarily focused on? Maybe appropriately so because that's a statutory requirement. You know, I can't comment on why people didn't submit a proposal, but I would, I would, I would say that that's that's likely in that their organization may, for example, not be actively involved in conservation in Colorado because that, you know, they might be a national organization that just doesn't have a Colorado chapter or affiliate, and they don't have, they don't have activities here. So I could see how that could be a. Uh, you know, something that would prevent them from Thank you. Uh, thank you. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just to sort of piggyback off of Commissioner Tushin's comment, um, just one suggestion um, is if we could just get a very, very high level view um, each year of what projects are being funded, um, that, that would be great. Because there is some really cool stuff that comes through this this program as well as uh, the committee process 
Um, and I think we need to do a better job of bragging about it. Um, Cause it's, there's some just, I have a good friend who, who's, who served there for many years and would hear about some of those projects and they're great. Um, but like a lot of things, CPW doesn't do a good job of bragging. Um, and so I, I think we need to brag a little bit more. Thank you, Joan. Again, um, I agree with what Commissioner Schaefer said, and we do need to brag a little bit. What we bring in from these licenses is amazing. And if, as someone who's done raffles before, you have to be licensed. It is a very hard thing to do. Um, in an organization I was involved with, we get it, we quit doing it because. It's extremely labor intensive really to get people to sell them, to buy them. It's a little bit easier today, I think, with COVID, but I'm not sure that that's going to continue that trend. Um, and if we only have so many applicants, that's what we have. But conservation groups are the ones that sell them, and they do a good job at it and have the history, the experience. Um, and it's a good thing, but we do need to brag about it after. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. And I, I echo the comments around elevating or fluid. I know it's working real hard to continue to communicate the good work of this agency and the outcomes and benefits of these programs. I did just have one comment around um, the earlier comment you made, which uh, was something to the effect of we need the funds because the costs are going up, essentially. I'm paraphrasing. Um, I 100% agree that the costs are going up. I also agree that this fund has been a wonderful stopgap to, to this increased need. Um, and I also wonder uh, and, and am hopeful that a day will come uh, where uh, we can all contribute to uh, our agency through our taxes so that we don't have to rely on the generosity of the wealthy and we don't have to rely on um, lottery ticket sales uh, and grant programs to cover um, our lands, wildlife, and water rights. The most precious things that we have um, as a state and as a country um, to the will of the, of the wealthy or those that want to have a lottery or those that have grant programs that really pay into the system uh, year after year after year. Then we don't have to worry or, you know, something happens or catastrophic kind of way. So I just wanted to make that comment of um, the importance of this fund. However, I, I hope that there is a day when we don't need this fund, where we have the monies um, in our budget to support the work that we need to do. Um, and that that money comes from all of the people so that not one group has more power than another. Thank you. Commissioner Adams, any further comments? Commissioner Garcia. Thank you. Uh, so I'm just curious, maybe you could help me on uh, this was our sidebar, our statutory sidebar. I like this and go, well, why aren't we doing a lot more of this? And I believe we just can't, right? Is that yeah, the, the statute is up to 18 licenses. That's it. Yeah, and we're already up the max. So we yeah, we and I would caution um there are states that have a lot more than 18, right. like hundreds. And you want the one thing you definitely have to keep in mind is those licenses come from somewhere and they come from the general quota that people apply for. And so I think that there's a balance and I personally am biased, but I think we have found the sweet spot with nine auction, nine campaign raffle, and that's 18 total out of all of our quotas for, for the whole, you know, hundreds of thousands of licenses for the whole state. That's helpful. Uh, and uh, I always look at it, just, I don't know why, I just assume Rocky Mountain Bighorn's going to do it, Ducks Unlimited is going to do it. But it's a competitive process. I assume it's just they've got the track record, they know how to do it, they're good at it, they end up at the top. Is that fair? Yes, that's fair. And, and, their, and their members are very passionate about those specific, like for DU, wetlands, and moose are, are a fit. And for like Rocky Mountain Bighorn Society, their members are very passionate about Bighorn Sheep. And so that's that's where the organizational attributes, the F criteria comes in, in that, that that's kind of their, that's in their wheel. That's what they do. I know these questions are all point because we're here for criteria, but my last one is for chair, co-chair making. I thought I remembered that these organizations came and gave us money at our meetings. 
Uh, with that check. And they also brought duck prints. Now, I, <laughs> a live spots are ducks unlimited, so I don't need another duck print. But we didn't have that this year. Something's a myth. So we still got the checks. <laughs> we got the checks. And in fact, we don't issue a license until we get the check. So that puts, you know, that brings the hunter in, like, why don't I have my license? And so we might not have got the display four foot by two foot check maybe because we didn't do an in-person meeting and that's where, I know we got one from RMBS in the November meeting, but that check that you're talking about, that symbolic big check is, is the at least 75% the, of the gross that they're returning to our agency. Well, Thank you, Commissioner Hassan. Thank you, Chairman. Um, just kind of a comment on what Charlie just said. Actually, a lot of those organizations that get these licenses put a lot of money back on the ground in the habitat. Not necessarily to us directly, but they do in various ways all across the state. So they, they benefit the wildlife in the state and people to conservation in those all kinds of ways that we don't need to And that would be D, use of funds. If, if one group says, we're going to spend it on a bigger banquet, and one group says it's going on the ground. That's where that's the sort of thing the committee can evaluate. Yeah, the groups like well, Trout Unlimited, Ducks Unlimited, even like Canada. What was the name of that group? They came and they they did a lot of wetlands work. It was the Canadian. A lot of these groups, Elk Foundation, they provide a lot of money that's not even part of this. It comes back to us also. I get your point. That's an excellent point. Beyond. Commissioner May. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to say it's a pleasure to sit here this morning and listen to a presentation like this. It sounds like everybody's happy. And I think the evaluation team sounds like, I mean, I don't know how you improve on it. So I just want to give credit where credit's due. It is Judy Cyber, Garrett Watson, Matthew Ecker, Maggie Van Cleef, and Andy. And I said accommodations to them to make something like this so beneficial for so many people. Thank you, Commissioner. I think that's it for comments or discussion. So with that, Andy, I think I can move forward. Uh, as I mentioned, this is an action. Item, so I will read the motion if that's necessary. Um, I believe <laughs> before I even got that head out, I've got it first from some uh, Commissioner May, but is there the, the motion? Is to approve the option raffle RP evaluation criteria as presented by staff, moved by Commissioner May. Second. Second. Second by Commissioner Gutstein. Um, I think we can do this one by voice vote. So all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed, same sign. Hearing none, it passes unanimously. Thank you very much, Andy. Thank you very much. We'll we'll go forth and, and uh, we'll be back in September with with uh, recommendations for authorization of these licenses. Thank you. Uh, well, that concludes item 22. So we're going to item 23, which is the election of our officers. We completed a ballot. We have received a form on every position. Uh, the officers that were elected as chair uh, of the commission is Commissioner Hauser, as vice chair of the commission, Commissioner Garcia, and as secretary of the commission, Commissioner Schaefer. So congratulations and look forward to your new leadership. Yes, Commissioner Hansen. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I don't, it's not on the agenda, so I'm calling Audible. Um, and that is to invite any or all of you to make a quick comment about our outgoing chair. Um, and I'm sorry I didn't ask the commission because I knew you wouldn't like this. <laughs> Right. Um, so I hope others will join me in um, again appreciating uh, Chairman McDaniel for his service on the commission, um, his um, astute um, performance as chair, um, and to just thank him for modeling something that I don't know that any of us could have predicted um, that we experienced last year um, in sort of Zoom land. So it was not easy, and I just want to express my appreciation. Thank you. Thank you. 
We just wanted to second Mr. Hauser's comments. It's really been a gift to serve a leader in leadership and be an incredible leader for our team, challenging times. He brought us back together, which I'm really grateful for. Um, and I also wanted to comment on how impeccably we maintain our timeliness. I think you're the end. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. It's a lot more than this. Not a stress. It's going to get to so good. Thank you, Krishna Lodi. I have to take a little more. Mr. Jackson, he's going to destroy my record. I just want to, you know, I've only been here at five. I only got to over that. But I wanted to thank you for. The welcome that you gave me uh, for putting up with uh, my initial missteps and confusion. Um, you did so in a very graceful manner. And I, I was, I didn't realize that you had, I don't think you had shared a meeting before the first one I attended, because I thought you'd been doing it for like 20 years. And I saw how professional you were and your demeanor was, um, I thought it was wonderful. So I just want to thank you for a great year and almost seeing you over there in that seat. Thank you. Commissioner Haskell. What's <laughs> in the blind spot? Sorry. <laughs> I want to say thank you for the, the last year has been great. Um, you definitely had more challenges than I think any chairman has had as far as COVID and dealing with all of the issues that we've had. But the one thing I remember, well, one of the first times, it wasn't the first time we were together, but we went to confirmation together. and. I happened to go right behind somebody who was not confirmed, but it wasn't very close. <laughs> and Barbara was just as cool as me. <laughs> and I will never forget that. <laughs> but thank you for all and, and supporting the sportsmen too in Colorado. Um, that's a big issue for me, and I appreciate all of you guys. Thank you. Commissioner Garcia. Thank you. Um, this is so you're the third chair. And uh, I remember Chair Karen Howard, and it was Richmond Hauser who said he set a bar. It's going to be tough to follow. And every chair has raised that bar, and you have raised it so high. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much. I really appreciate all the comments. Uh, I did have something I wanted to say, and I'm going to keep it short. So I can adjourn on time. Uh, if I don't get through it, because I'm a pretty emotional guy, uh, just remember that I really appreciated the opportunity to serve. Um, it went by really fast. Uh, it was a lot of work. And I wrote this out, so maybe I thought we needed to help you get through it. A lot of work, but also you know, it was a really fantastic experience. Um, for me, it was a true honor to represent and serve uh, the citizens of this state, but most importantly, uh, all the sports men and women. Um, I hope I made a real difference to preserve and enhance the conservation and use of our state's wildlife and parks. Uh, I can tell you I learned a lot in my term. You know, one was how complicated, how vital, how important uh, CPW is to our state and DNR uh, in total. Uh, how passionate, intelligent, hardworking, uh, ethical, high integrity the employees of this agency are. Uh, a lot of people tease about state employees, but trust me, this agency doesn't fit that much at all. It's incredible. Um, I was also, and they're, and they're really passionate about their mission. They understand what their mission is and, and they live it. Um, how passionate my fellow commissioners are. And uh, some of the ones in the past that have really influenced me, like uh, Jeremy Howard and um, Cheryl Zimmerman and Robert Bray, and Jimmy Bell, you know, real mentors to me. Um, so I want to thank all of you for, you know, the imprint you've left on me and how I live the rest of my life. Um, there are too many great sporting and conservation organizations to name really thank um, but uh, I do want to thank them for their work and partnering with us and preserving and enhancing 
our wildlife and outdoors, and it couldn't be done without them. Uh, and thank all of them. Uh, but most of all, I want to thank the sporting community, the representatives, and all the sports persons that I represent or represented over the last few years. Uh, thanks for allowing me to do that. Uh, and thanks for all their help and support uh, and feedback and allowing me to represent them. Anyway, uh, thanks to uh, all of you, and I'll see you in the outdoors, and uh, look forward to many citizens' petitions for me. <laughs> June 10th and 11th, CPW meeting, inch, uh, commission meeting. Pause, uh, commissioner Marty. <laughs> I just also wanted to honor Commissioner Haskett for his service. It's really been a gift to serve with you. Thank you so much for really this year. So much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Meeting is adjourned.